She's back on. Um, she, Nandita, she's on, but she can't hear. I mean, I can see that her microphone is grayed out, which means that her audio is not set up properly. And then Abiola, who's with her in Nigeria, is also all of her icons are in gray, which means she's not connected. It could be that she went to, she disconnected while she was trying to coordinate with Dorothy. Um, okay, so without uh, a further ado, we'll get started. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here on the IATT webinar series, and today we'll be talking about WHO guidelines. Um, and our presenters will be providing an overview of where we are now with the current guidelines and give us a prelude of the anticipated changes to the new guidelines. The first presentation focuses on the guideline revision process and highlights the future direction of the guidelines. And then the follow-up presentations will go into depth on the evidence-based rationale and WHO recommend recommendations on three key guidelines, cotrimoxazole, post-exposure prophylaxis, and skin and opportunistic infections. To break up the webinar and to ensure that it's interactive, we will have a pause after the first two presentations for questions and then a second Q&A session at the end of the webinar. So we also will be quite flexible given some of the connectivity issues and may change around the, the order of the presentations, but we'll still follow that same format. And although this is an update of the clinical guidelines, we would very much like to hear about lessons learned, country experiences in disseminating and implementing these guidelines, and hope it will uh, inform future processes. And so far, it looks like Dorothy might be back, so uh, we're happy that, that she's there, and we'll confirm that uh, later on. But without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first presenter, Martina Penazato, who's the pediatric focal point for in the HIV AIDS department of the WHO, and she's also the co-chair of the IATT Child Survival Working Group. And she will be discussing the WHO guidelines directions. So with that, I'll turn it over to Martina for the first presentation. Thank you very much, Jessica, and thank you, everyone. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Um, my presentation will provide a very brief overview of uh, some of the work that WHO is doing in terms of normative guidance development, and will um, and will try to put into the context uh, of the broader work in on normative guidance some of the pieces that you will hear more about today. So. Um, okay, so the slide can be seen. Um, do I, can anyone see the slide? Jessica, can you see the slide? Yes. Background? Okay. The background um, slide? Number four? Yeah. Yes. I don't we can't see the slide being like No. You um, can't. I can't see, but I I can probably follow. I can't even move the slides, so you may need to take back the presenter okay. function, and then I can. Okay, let's see. Can everyone see it now? No. Uh, yes, it looks like. No, 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 this is an attachment. <laughs> Participants are saying they can see the slide. Okay, that's okay. perfect. So I'll just continue. Okay. And apologies for these um, problems. So um, I think that so the, in, in terms of background, I just wanted to emphasize how um, adoption and implementation of global guidelines that are based on evidence is is, is seen as really the key approach to uh, uh, to scale up treatment and care for uh, people living with HIV and to really make progress towards ending the AIDS epidemic. 
Um, the existing guidelines by WHO on the use of ARVs are the ones that are, were um, launched and presented in 2013, so the 2013 consolidated guidelines that included 50 new and updated policy recommendations that um, were developed across the clinical, operational, programmatic and any aspect of uh, HIV treatment and care. And we know that thanks to the support of some of you on the call as well, WHO has engaged from uh, after September 2013 uh, with a number of partners to disseminate these guidelines across six regions. Um, we know that the 2013 guidelines were probably the first project uh, of consolidation that the HIV department engaged with, and the consolidation happened across population and ages along the continuum of care and obviously in terms of some of the products that uh, were um, available at that time. So um, you may remember that some of the key features of uh, the 2013 guidelines in terms of clinical recommendation were earlier treatment initiation for all people living with HIV less than 500 CD4. And uh, some specific subset of the population were prioritized over others. And uh, we also recommended starting treatment regardless of clinical immunological condition in all children less than five years. There was some alignment uh, that was made in terms of drug regimen be used for adolescents with adults. And uh, another key recommendation that I'm sure you're familiar with is treating, uh, starting um, triple ART in all pregnant and breastfeeding women with option B and B plus being recommended. We also had simpler and um, fewer and le less toxic um, first-line regimen being recommended, and again, uh, alignment was um, was um, reached in, in many cases. We also had a number of key recommendations on the operational side. Um, the use of fixed dose combination was one of the critical ones, but we also had improved patient monitoring with increased use of viral load. Um, task shifting, decentralization, integration were seen as critical elements to uh, provide better service delivery models, and community-based testing and ARV delivery um, were also uh, part of these guidelines. Since then, uh, WHO has developed a number of documents and technical updates that have had the purpose of expanding and articulating more some of the nuances of some specific topics. And um, this work was collected in two specific um, supplements to the 2013 ARV guidelines. One was issued in March, and the second one was issued at the end of last year. This last one contained new recommendations on treating and managing opportunistic infection for skin and oral manifestation uh, to uh, treat, to um, uh, the implementation of uh, cochimoxazole prophylaxis as well as the use of uh, PEP. And this is the focus of uh, this web webinar today. So uh, these elements were contained in two key documents uh, that you see highlighted here. Um, one again um, issued um, at the beginning of 2014 and then um, later on in December 2014 with the supplement, as I mentioned, to the 2013 ARV guidelines. All these recommendations were developed with a standard approach that WHO adopts, uh, which is called GRADE. And for those of you that are familiar with it, uh, you may remember that um, this uh, approach um, measured the robustness of the evidence, so the quality of the evidence uh, that supports a given recommendation, and is also meant to express the confidence that the guidelines development group has in that specific recommendation uh, by assessing some of those elements that you see listed in the, in the box there. This approach was used for all the sections of the guidelines. It's the same approach that is has been used for the revision of the 2013 guidelines, which is still ongoing, and that will lead to developing uh, the new revised guidelines. So the new guidelines that uh, are under finalization uh, will uh, include a number of key elements, and as you can see from this slide on the clinical side, um, recommendation will address the when to start question, will address the what to use, 
uh, in first, second, and third line accounting for toxicity. Uh, will um, will uh, address the use of uh, ARPs for prevention, uh, both in terms of PrEP as well as infant prophylaxis, and will capture some of uh, the additional elements attached to the use of diagnostics, both for uh, early infant diagnosis as well as monitoring. On the operational side, there's a number of questions that uh, have been addressed and will be addressed. Um, which include the package of care, in, will include improving the continued care with a number of different interventions that are listed in the slide, as you can, as you can see. Um, and then um, uh, other elements such as fast shifting infants and pediatric HIV testing, and um, a number of other elements such as connectivity for rapid results, turnaround, and adolescent-friendly services. There will also be a focus on service integration, which will include uh, some elements around um, uh, mental health and um, cardiovascular disease screening. So for those of you that were at Vancouver or that heard um, some of the, the updates from the conference, um, you may know already that um, some key directions were shared. Um, in particular, uh, WHO um, uh, outline the direction of moving to treating all patients living with HIV, irrespective of CD4. Um, the sickest uh, patient would remain as a priority, and adolescents are now seen as a um, separate population and are um, flagged uh, more clearly to capture some nuances of this subpopulation. Uh, there is, as a result, um, option B uh, is the is um, the emphasized. And, um, and uh, in Vancouver, uh, the uh, other elements that direction that was shared was the use of ARV for prevention as an additional prevention choice for old people at risk uh, of HIV infection. So I will conclude with this last slide, which is about timeline, and it gives you a sense of uh, where we are at uh, the next um, uh, document that uh, WHO um, has planned to share. It's um, expected to come to us the end of September, early October, and um, that would, it will focus on key recommendation around the use of PrEP and uh, the when to start um, in people living with HIV. The full guidelines document that will include all the elements that I've mentioned uh, is expected to be completed and finalized towards the end of the year, beginning of next year. And I conclude with that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martina. And next, we'll turn it over to Dorothy. Dorothy, are you there? Dorothy, I see you're logged in, but I can see that your audio still might be having problems. If you can, I would suggest that you coordinate with Abiola to to maybe use her computer because she seems like she's properly linked in. Hello, uh, Jessica. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Okay. okay I'm on. And good afternoon. Good morning to everybody. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present uh, during this uh, webinar on the recently uh, revised uh, guidelines on cholecystomoxis or prophylaxis in children. So the first question you may be asking yourself is, you know, why bother uh, uh, with these revisions and why look at these guidelines? And uh, part of what motivated the new look into the guidelines was the changing landscape in terms of um, wide-scale scale-up of um, treatment as part as, as an earlier initiation of treatment. And so asking the question, would the co-treatment prophylaxis still be something we would want to do? Additionally, there was a whole issue of new evidence. The, as you may recall, the 2006 guidelines were really made with very sparse data. New evidence became available from clinical trials and other studies uh, on how to prevent morbidity and mortality across varying levels of uh, background resistance to cotrimoxazole and prevalence of malaria. And so this motivated um, the new look at the guidelines. And the key questions we were asking ourselves then were, 
when to start um, prophylaxis in children and adults and when to stop uh, prophylaxis and then um, zeroing in very much on the HIV exposed infants and uh, as well as the, the pregnant women. In the webinar today we will be discussing the pediatric data and not very much focusing on the, the pregnant women or adult data. Mm. Jessica, I'll need you to move my slides for me, please. Thank you. So, when do we start cotrimostazole prophylaxis and what informed this data? The decision, the, the data that was reviewed by the um, guideline committee really emanated from one robust clinical trial uh, regarding when to start. And this was uh, uh, the CHAP trial in Zambia, a double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized trial that focused on children aged 1 to 14 years who had clinical features of HIV infection. The main outcomes in this study were mortality with secondary outcomes related to hospitalization and uh, um, uh, malaria and clinical um, inf and, uh, severe bacterial infections. Now to note that this study showed that cotrim prophylaxis was highly efficacious and, and was actually stopped uh, prematurely when they found a 43% reduction in mortality um, on, in, the, in the arm where children were continuing prophylaxis versus the arm where children were stopping prophylaxis. And uh, this was a highly, clinically, a highly statistically significant and uh, the, the effect was seen across all CD4 ranges and across all ages in the children. Now in using these data for guidelines to inform the guidelines, the guideline development group acknowledged that most children in the CHAP trial were already immunosuppressed and so eligible for uh, cotrim prophylaxis. And so the, the, the data were then downgraded for uh, the, the, and the difficulty with generalizing uh, these findings to children whose CD4s were still high or still had not met, um, had, had, didn't have severe immunosuppression. But, um, very informative data, very robust data that clearly showed for the first time that uh, discontinuation um, was not an option and that ongoing uh, treatment was, was good. Next slide, please. So the next question that the... Um, next slide, please. So what, what was the rationale, what was the thinking that the guideline group went through when they were trying to now use these data to come up with the guidelines? We know that uh, high value was placed on the fact that this was RCT data, so very robust clinical data, clinical trial data. And they also recognized the fact that we wanted to prioritize and harmonize the data or the recommendations with the adult data. So. Or, or whereas this was largely dealing with immunocompromised children, we were, wanted to harmonize with the, adult, um, with, the, with, with the adult population. During the decision-making process, robust discussions were had around acceptability of on continuing uh, cotrim prophylaxis endlessly. And um, whereas we don't have existing data on this, we recognize that they, they might not be a ma major issue given the, um, the, the, it may not be a major issue given the good clinical outcome, but that we didn't know about acceptabilities. And so this is an area that we need to continue to look at, and we, we then downgraded the strength of the, the recommendation. Next slide, please. So what do these guidelines about when to start cotrimox prophylaxis actually say? We say, it says that we should initiate daily cotrim for all infants and adolescents living with HIV, irrespective of clinical and immunological stage. And this is a strong recommendation based on low quality evidence, based uh, on low quality evidence, particularly because it was indirect clinical trial data. And um, the second portion of the guidelines talk to the issue of prioritization, where we recognize that the clinical trial data that we used 
was really focusing in on immunosuppressed children. And so prioritization should be given to children who have clinical stage 3 or 4 and uh, children aged less than 5 years with CD4s below 350 for children over 5 years. And this is a strong recommendation with high quality evidence. So again, you can see that we have two layers, of the, uh, two layers in the recommendation. The first layer saying all should be initiated, but the, uh, which has low quality evidence. And the second saying that we should have um, prioritization of immunosuppressed children, which is uh, based on very robust clinical trial data. Next slide, please. So having decided to start all children on prophylaxis, when should one stop uh, cotrim prophylaxis in children? This uh, recommendation was informed by the ARROW trial, which is a randomized, open-label, non-inferiority trial, which will look at stopping uh, prophylaxis versus continuing daily, and was, and was conducted in Uganda and Zimbabwe. The, the number of children studied was 758 children, so a fairly large study with, uh, of uh, children three years and older and who had received ART. So very relevant to our current cortex where we are initiating treatment early, many of our children are going to already be on ART as we think about prophylaxis. So what did the study find? The study found that over a median of two years of follow-up, children and adolescents receiving ART with a median CD4 count of 720 cells and a CD4% of 33%, Continuing cotrim prophylaxis was associated with fewer deaths or hospitalizations. And this effect was sustained over time and was observed in settings with and without malaria, so applicable to many settings. So continuing prophylaxis was safe over the same follow-up period in this randomized trial with no severe drug-related adverse events observed. So very robust data to inform us around our decision-making for stopping prophylaxis. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, thank you. A secondary outcome of the study, which many people were very interested in, is the role of cotrim prophylaxis in addressing uh, malaria morbidity and mortality. And in the, in, in the ARROW study, the uh, Uganda site actually looked at this issue. And they, they noted that in children with diagnostically confirmed malaria, so that's malaria diagnosed either by microscopy or by uh, rapid diagnostic tests, the risk of malaria was found to be twice as high in the arm where prophylaxis was stopped than in the prophylaxis continued arm with a hazard ratio of 2.2. So basically saying that um, cotrim prophylaxis was very effective in preventing uh, malaria um, admissions and in, in fact also uh, um, affecting the severity of the malaria as well. Next slide, please. So how were these data used as the rationale for uh, uh, informing the guidelines? Um, the systematic review supported that continuing cotrim prophylaxis in childhood uh, was important, and this was data based on this single uh, RCT. However, because we did not know what long, t we, did, we did not have long-term data on uh, uh, potential benefits and, pot uh, and uh, toxicities, we know that some uncertainty really remains around uh, uh, long-term cotrim prophylaxis. So we also looked at the issue of feasibility and the cost implication of extended cotrim prophylaxis beyond the uh, currently recommended um, period to, to, to recommend it to be happening throughout childhood. Now since the ARROW trial showed that continuing cotrim prophylaxis improved health outcomes at reduced cost, which we looked at basically at reduced cost related to reduced hospitalization, reduced illness. The overall strength of the recommendation was, um, was ranked as conditional because uh, we're not sure there was uncertainty around the issue of toxicity and the long-term benefit. So what do the guidelines actually looked at, uh, look like based on these data? Next slide, please. 
WHO is currently then recommending that in high prevalence areas of malaria or in areas where and or in areas where severe bacterial infections uh, occur, daily cotrimoxazole prophylaxis in HIV infected children irrespective of ART should be continued until adulthood. And this recommendation is strong. Uh, sorry, this recommendation is conditional and the quality of uh, evidence is moderate um, because it was uh, downgraded. Now, in, in uh, settings with low prevalence of both malaria and severe bacterial infections, as in some regions of the world, then daily cotrimoxazole may be discontinued for children above five years who are clinically, clinically stable and or virologically suppressed on ART for at least six months and, and CD4 is above 350. And this was a, a, a recommendation, a strong recommendation, but it had very low quality evidence driving it. So what we're saying is that uh, in, in areas with high disease burden of malaria and, um, and severe bacterial infections, we continue. The data are not robust, but the, the, the quality of the evidence is moderate. Next slide, please. So let's turn our eyes now to children who are HIV exposed but uninfected. And we know that the rationale for um, initiating cotrine prophylaxis in HIV exposed infected infants is actually to cover the period of time when there is risk for HIV transmission. And so in breastfeeding populations, this is much longer. And in non-breastfeeding populations, it is a shorter period of time. And um, we, strong recommendations were made around cotrine prophylaxis for this period of time and now we have additional data that may inform our decision to go forward with this recommendation. We also have um, some data which talk to specifically to the issue around the added benefit of extended prophylaxis beyond the period of risk uh, for protecting uh, infants um, from malaria and from severe bacterial infections. Previously, we had limited data on this. So let us see what the data, new data look like. Next slide, please. So the first area we looked at was in the area of malaria. And shown here is a survival curve from the study comparing the time to first malaria episode in 185 HIV-infected children who are randomized either to continue prophylaxis or to discontinue prophylaxis, as you remember the, the, uh, the study we earlier talked about. And what they did show that there was a statistically significant difference in the incidence of malaria when you continue prophylaxis versus when you discontinue. And the survival curves are very uh, obvious on this. This difference was sustained over time and uh, with increasing age. So children with malaria on prophylaxis had um, a, a prolonged or ongoing benefit to prophylaxis as relates to malaria incidence. And, uh, and, and so additionally, children with malaria in either, in either arm, who are in, children in malaria who were in the, dis, in the continuation arm, so they were on prophylaxis, had less severe disease as was evidenced by lower parasitemia and the lower parasite densities. And so what we see is that cotrine prophylaxis in HIV-exposed infants has clear uh, clinical benefits, both in terms of incidence and in terms of disease severity. Next slide, please. So we then also went on to look at the um, uh, protective efficacy of cotrine prophylaxis against respiratory infections and diarrheal disease. And uh, this was done across a number of, of um, uh, cohort studies. And what we see was that there was a, um, no, this was done in the same RCT. And what we see is that there was a 37% increased risk of respiratory infections that was non-significant and a 9% protective effect for diarrheal episode also non-significant. Basically, the, these data were noted by the guideline committee to have severe imprecision and uh, uh, the, the, the main uh, out, and they were, since the, this was not the main outcome for the RCT, 
the evidence on the data considered was of low quality and so and since it did not directly address the issue so we were not able to clearly talk to the issue of deaths pneumonia and diarrhea uh, in hiv exposed infants using rct data however next slide please we have a number of we have a number of cohort studies that have looked at this issue over the a period of time intervening between the last guidelines and now. And now when we look at these data, in the first two years of life, we see that HIV infect exposed infants Dorothy? Oh my. Oh my, I, I see now that people are not seeing the slide. Yes, it's it's okay. Continue. We're recording it and we're sending it mm. um, to everyone after the webinar. So it, 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 this is, you know, you have a good rhythm. So I think we just have to keep going. Some people can and some people can't. <laughs> so it really, you know, we're trying to resolve it. Oh, IT I apologize. Is here I would have been a bit it's more okay. elaborate on the slide. It's okay. We also don't have, you know, there's not I'm a lot sorry, of time I've as well. a little well. bit more elaborate on the slide. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. So I guess on the issue of uh, um, death, pneumonia, and diarrhea, we have a lot of cohort studies now that have informed us on this that have generally shown uh, benefit in terms of reduction in mortality uh, related to malaria, uh, uh, pneumonia, and diarrhea, and uh, also uh, reductions in death. And um, what we see is a, a 30, around a 30% reduction in deaths, pneumonia, and diarrhea in children who are HIV exposed but uninfected uh, who are on prophylaxis. And I, I also wanted to sort of uh, couch this all in the background of the fact that we now know that children who are HIV exposed and uninfected have higher mortality and morbidity than children who uh, are uh, and, and exposed to HIV. And so these are important data that really give us impetus to continue to roll out a cotromoxisol prophylaxis for HIV exposed infants. Next slide, please. So to summarize, regarding the issue of cotrim prophylaxis in HIV infect exposed infants, the group considered that the evidence of clinical benefit for HIV-exposed uninfected infants who are not at risk of acquiring HIV infection is insufficient to recommend the use of cotrim prophylaxis in this population globally. Although there is a benefit demonstrated by randomized evidence that it, uh, of reducing uh, malaria, the guideline committee recognized that we wanted to uh, maintain the existing recommendations because we now have alternative interventions to address the issue of malaria. So although the, the clinical data showed very robust protection on, of prophylax, uh, culture and prophylaxis against malaria, we know that we have intermittent preventive treatment for, for infants, we have bed nets, we have other uh, vaccines coming up to deal with the bacterial infections like pneumococcal vaccines, rotavirus vaccines, etc. And so that these should be prioritized rather than extending the use of cotrim prophylaxis uh, in this population. So basically, the, the, the existing guidelines stand, though the, 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 it was simplified and the language improved. On Next slide, please. So there you have uh, the guidelines that it speaks now. Cotrimoxazole is recommended for HIV-exposed infants from four to six weeks of age and should be continued until HIV infection has been excluded by an age-appropriate HIV test to establish final di diagnosis after complete cessation of breastfeeding. Again, our evidence is very low, though the strength of the recommendation remains high because we really feel that this is an important intervention for uh, HIV-exposed infants. Next slide, please. So, here, the summary of, herein is a summary of the new uh, uh, recommendations, and we, you see that the recommendations of children are really phrased, uh, 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 are framed within the context of the recommendations for adults um, living with HIV, including pregnant women. 
and um, and other uh, uh, populations living with HIV, such as individuals with active TB. Next slide, please. So zero. Oh, previous slide, please. So zeroing in, we we're saying all children uh, who have HIV should be started on cotrim prophylaxis. It should go on for the duration of childhood. Children greater than five years with severe and advanced disease should be prioritized. And uh, we should not stop if uh, um, individuals are living in high prevalence uh, settings of malaria and severe bacterial infections. And that in areas where this is not the case, then you, you, should, you could consider stopping. Next slide, please. I will not go into detail about the implementation considerations because I see from the participation of uh, this um, uh, webinar that we have many people who are actually doing the nitty gritty. But just to flag um, nitty gritty implementation of cotrim prophylaxis, but just to flag that um, as we go forward, things that we really do need to consider if we want to have this intervention scaled widely is the whole issue of commodity management. We also need to be sure that um, we have adequately fund uh, cotrim prophylaxis and that there are no user fees attached to this. And uh, um, those of us taking care of children um, uh, with HIV should ensure that we link up with other programs like the malaria program and the immunization program so that we are ensured that our children also benefit from the additional um, interventions across uh, these other um, uh, sectors. And I will not highlight all the issues that are listed on that slide, but leave it for the participants to read. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dorothy, and for um, giving a wonderful overview, despite the fact that we had some trouble with the slides. Um, and Dorothy Mabori-Gacha is the chief of HIV in the UNICEF Nigeria office and we thank you very much for joining us today. So at this time we'll break for some questions from the audience. We hope you were able to listen uh, to the presentation and um, and gather the main uh, ideas regarding cotrimoxazole prophylaxis as well as the new directions of the guidelines that were presented earlier. So please send in any questions that you may have. And in the meantime, we'll load the next presentation and hopefully um, those of you who are not unable to see the slides will be able to. So again, it's open for any questions you may have. Any questions, comments? Hi, Jessica. This is Nandita. Hi, Hi Nandita. Um, uh, I was just wondering if any of the partners or country folks on the team um, could speak of their experiences in implementing uh, Cotrim and some of the, the challenges um, around around implementation because I, I I do feel like that it has been a big challenge. Um, so it would be great to hear from some of the countries about what they're they're facing. We have a question from Yaye. Yaye, feel free to speak up or type in your question. Okay, while Yaye is preparing her question, does anyone else have? Okay. Is there more recent data on contramoxazole coverage than 2012 when coverage was 31 percent? So Dorothy, Martina, or any of the other presenters, would you like to respond to that? 
And uh, we received a comment saying that contramoxazole coverage globally is 49%. So just a, a correction on the uh, on the coverage percentage. And Yaye has asked, why are HIV exposed infants having a higher rate of mortality or morbidity? So Dorothy, do you, can you respond to that? Can you hear us? Hello, Jessica, I hear you. Okay. You know, this, this intriguing finding of um, the higher rate of Mobility, uh, and mortality in terms of uh, HIV exposed infants hasn't really been completely unraveled. They're, they, hmm, I'm getting a lot of echo. Dorothy, it should be okay now. Somebody joined and, and unmuted their phone. Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, so I was saying that the issue of uh, um, morbidity and mortality in HIV-exposed infants, um, that increased uh, risk that has been observed, hasn't been completely unraveled. And there are many theories. Um, you know, there, there, there are theories around the quality of passive immunity that is infants receive from a, a transplant essentially from their HIV infected mothers who might themselves have a, a, a limited antibody to transfer across. Um, there, there are issues around um, the, the caregiving practices within um, since their, their, their mothers are HIV infected so the caregiving practices. The issues around um, these children, infants living in households where um, the, the burden of mobility is higher j just by virtue of the fact that the adults in that household have HIV. But, um, you know, this is something that hasn't been clearly understood and it's uh, uh, the subject of ongoing studies. Hey, thank you, Dorothy. The next question is, what would you recommend for HIV-exposed infants who have other comorbidities, for example, malnutrition? HIV-exposed infants with comorbidities, um, of course, we recommend, um, we recommend that the, all infants be on cotrim prophylaxis, so they would be on cotrim prophylaxis. Now, if they have other ongoing comorbidities that require treatment, um, I'm suspecting that you're talking to the issue of uh, pill burden and so forth, then this is a clinical decision that needs to be prioritized. But at, at baseline, all, all HIV-exposed infants, regardless of comorbidity profile, should actually be on cotrim prophylaxis. I hope I'm reading the question correctly, Lydia. Lydia, did that respond to your question? Okay, you'll let us know if you have any follow-up questions. And then um, yeah, similar, okay, similar to uh, uh, that topic, we'll get back to the question on adolescence, but um, this question is, in case we extend cotrimoxazole in HIV-exposed infants, how long should we extend it for? So that's from Baylor, Uganda. Yeah. So, the, yeah, yeah. So this was the, this was actually the question that people were asking, and and um, you know the guideline committee did not see merit in extending beyond the period of risk. So um, HIV exposed infants who breastfeed would then get cotrimoxazole prophylaxis for the duration of period of risk of HIV acquisition. But beyond that, the evidence of the data did not show any merit in continuing. Um, uh, uh, cotrim prophylaxis. And so then, uh, right now, we are not recommending extension. So if you, in case you extend, I don't know what would be motivating, motivating the extension. Is it ongoing HIV risk? In that event, then you would stop 
at the at the period of time when you feel that there's no longer ongoing risk so in breastfeeding populations okay and again somewhat related is uh, the question around resistance of cotrimoxazole due to non-adherence so if so how would we address this for hiv exposed exposed infants on extended use That's actually a very interesting question, and it's one of the questions that people were asking when um, they, they did the, 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 the CHAP study, and they were really asking, in the background of high resistance to cotrimoxazole uh, in these communities, will uh, prophylaxis still be uh, useful whatsoever? And, and surprisingly, they found that, that this was the case. And I think this is um, part, of, part, of the, uh, part of this relates to the actual uh, drug itself, and uh, it, it always surprises people that cotrim prophylaxis works even in in a, in a setting where um, you would not use it for treatment. So you would not limit your use of cotrim prophylaxis in settings where there's high background uh, resistance to cotrim oxazole because clinical trials have actually now shown us that it's still very effective. Okay, and a question of clarification. Do we stop prophylaxis immediately after breastfeeding stops in HIV-exposed infants or one to two weeks after breastfeeding stops? Okay, yeah, yeah. So this is, this is also important. So um, it, would be, it, it, would, it would not be like usually the, the guidance that we give is uh, two weeks after cessation of breastfeeding. And usually that's the, guide, the guidance that it stands that uh, once the, the uh, mother has stopped breastfeeding and you're sure she has stopped, and that's usually two weeks after um, she has stopped breastfeeding, then you can actually stop uh, your cotton prophylaxis. Okay, great. Thank you for the clarification, Dorothy. And then the next question from Zoma N.A. is, in view of the fact that prophylaxis can go on into adolescence in some areas, what guidance should be given in case of pregnancy in adolescent girls? Is there any specific guidance for that population? <laughs> Now, we're now bridging onto the, the area we said we were not going to talk too much about today, and that, that's the whole issue of uh, 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 use of cotrim in, in pregnancy. We don't have a lot of data on this, and um, we have some, uh, there have been concerns around, um, safety concerns around the use of cotrim in pregnancy, um, and really small studies, I think from the UK and, and so forth, showing uh, adverse events in, in, in um in uh, a pregnancy, but the data are, are limited and not enough to um, influence our use of cotrimoxazole in, in pregnancy. But the use of cotrimoxazole in pregnancy also relates to the issue of um, what you do within your malaria program. So you remember we always, we always have, if it's in an endemic area, mothers are probably already on um, 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 presumptive uh, malaria, uh, intermittent presumptive malaria prophylaxis, and so then they would, would not give them cotrim ab 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 over and above this. If you're in areas where malaria is not endemic, then they would be getting uh, cotrim prophylaxis. And as things stand now, we don't have robust data that talk to um, uh, severe adverse events either for the mother or for the baby. Okay, thank you, Dorothy. And this is a question regarding... Yes? yes? Sorry, um, we're WHO here from Geneva, and we're here in the team of us, and uh, Nathan Ford has been doing the systematic review looking at the use of cotrimoxazole in pregnancies here with us, so maybe he could say a few words about that. Okay, great, wonderful. Thank you, Nathan. <laughs> Yeah, so, hi everybody. Um, so we did conduct a systematic review to look at safety of cotrimoxazole in pregnancy and um, we looked across um, all um, disease areas so we didn't limit it to HIV use um, because um, the risk of toxicity was not considered to be limited to HIV positive pregnant women alone. And we identified um, 24 studies and the overall conclusion, and, and this review was published um, um, 
recently, late last year, in the Journal of the International Aid Society. So we can share that um, with the group or anyone who's interested. But the conclusion was that although there was um, a signal of a potentially increased risk of congenital um, anomalies associated with exposure to cotrimoxazole in pregnancy, that risk was considered to be outweighed by the um, substantial benefit of providing cotrimoxazole to pregnant women, and there was some uncertainty around the magnitude of the risk. So that led the expert group to feel confident to recommend cotrimoxazole um, administration to pregnant women, despite some potential concerns about risk. And, and, and the other conclusion was that, indeed, we need to continue to survey and collect data um, to, to provide further evidence for the future. Thank you very much, Nathan. Does anyone else from the WHO team want to respond to any of the questions or issues that were raised so far? Uh, Jessica, maybe I just wanted to flag another element in terms of uh, when to stop cotrimoxazole after breastfeeding. I think it's really important to uh, remember why we're giving cotrimoxazole and the reason being that we, we suspect that these children are actually infected. So until testing is done and uh, their negative status is certain, uh, one would want to, um, to continue that. So hopefully that will happen uh, quickly quickly and soon after uh, cessation of breastfeeding, and, and that should be considered as an important link to whether and when to stop uh, cotrimoxazole. Okay, thank you. If there are no other comments uh, or responses from WHO, then we'll move on to the next question, which is regarding is cotrimoxazole syrup suspension readily available? Would anyone like to respond to that from WHO or any other partners online? I mean, um, so from WHO perspective, it would be great to hear from countries whether they feel like that's readily available and it's um, been used. Um, so if partners are on the yes. line, it would be great to hear. Exactly. If there are any other participants working in different countries who'd like to chime in, feel free Jessica? to do so. Yes, Nandita. Nandita. I, I mean, I, I cannot tell you that I'm a supply chain expert, but some of my experiences in countries is that um, uh, the ARV drugs will come in through a separate procurement channel, and the CPT, uh, the cotrimoxazole, because it's a regularly used antibiotic. Um, usually comes in from the essential medicines, or at least that's what I've seen in a few places. I'm not sure if that's what other countries are experiencing. Great. Florence from Swaziland has confirmed that cotrimoxazole syrup has been readily available in, in her context, so um, she's also contributed that. Again, perhaps if, if along the way different partners want to talk about this issue um, online, we're also confirming the same from Ethiopia, that availability hasn't been a problem. Are there, and Namibia as well, are there any other questions? Okay, and Venvisa, who, who originally asked the question, said that in Malawi it, it's not readily available, um, but other countries seem to confirm that that it has been in Lesotho, Namibia, um, in addition to pediatric cotrimoxazole tabs for older infants. Are there any other questions regarding cotrimoxazole guidelines or new directions for the guidelines in 2015 and 2016. And if not, I think we'll continue on to the next presentation, which will focus on post-exposure prophylaxis. 
And the presenter is Linda Barlow Mosha, who is a pediatrician and senior investigator at McCary University, John Hopkins University Research Collaboration Project in Kampala, Uganda, where she has worked since 2003. And she's led multiple research studies that address critical questions regarding pediatric HIV prevention, care, and treatment. Without further ado, we'll turn it over to Linda Barla-Mosha to give our next presentation. Linda, are you with us? Hi, I'm, I'm with you. Okay, great. Um, but, but and unfortunately, we've... I don't have control of the, of the slides, okay, so I'll so have to ask you to, that's to no change problem. them. Yeah, great, that's no problem. And I think, uh, at least for now, we've been able to resolve the problem of seeing the slides, so. Okay, well, we'll thank you. start when you're ready. Okay. Thank you very much for allowing me to present today. Um, so I'll just start off by giving a little bit of the background of what um, the, the, the members of the committee that came together to discuss post-exposure prophylaxis. Um, as you know, PEP is widely accepted and has been prescribed. However, completion rates have not been very optimal. And in the WHO guidelines of 2007, it primarily focused on adults and also occupational exposures. And at that time, AZT was the preferred drug of choice for, um, for PEP. So basically, when, when we met, there was a need to simplify and harmonize the recommendation for treatment, as well as to update the recommendation um, supported by systematic reviews. So next slide, please. Okay. So as you know, there's really limited evidence that has been gathered for the use of PEP in children. And nevirapine has been discouraged, um, especially among HIV-negative individuals who have high CD4 counts and more likely to have a reaction. However, it's been widely used for PMTCT in HIV-exposed infants. And the pediatric formulations are actually still quite limited. Um, tenofovir is only um, indicated for those children who are above two years of age, while darunavir has a limitation of three years and above. Adazanavir is only indicated for those children who are six years and above, and raltagavir actually has um, a wider range uh, with indications for children who are two weeks and above. However, it's not readily available in resource-limited settings. So really, the pediatric formulations that we have to choose from are quite limited. And there was a need to harmonize um, the ARVs chosen for PEP with what is actually available as far as drugs go. Next slide, please. So just as a reminder, and I'm sure most of you already know these recommendations, um, the most recent WHO recommendations for antiretroviral therapy for children under three recommends lopinavir ritonavir based treatment with either a back of a 3TC or um, lopinavir ritonavir and ADT and 3TC. For children under three, um, nevirapine is actually still an alternative. And when you look at those who are between three and 10, we've now turned to a favorins plus a back of and 3TC with the alternative choices of AZT and 3TC and tenofovir and 3TC. But having said that, there's still an issue of availability of the formulation for that age group for TDF. Next slide, please. So the scope of the WHO PEP guidelines focused on risk rather than exposure type. So the committee was tasked to provide a single guideline for all age groups and we had to come up with a recommendation that was made for adults, adolescents, and children. And with the hope of aligning the recommendation with that that was already provided for antiretroviral therapy. And there was an emphasis on simplification so that there was ease in getting access to the antiretroviral therapy and also to help support um, 
completion rates. So next slide, please. So when we looked at the evidence, we had a, a series of uh, reviews. First, we looked at efficacy data from animal studies. We also looked at PEP completion rates from cohort studies. Uh, we reviewed art choices, and they were cohort studies, but in in, in cases where they weren't, there wasn't enough um, evidence as far as cohort studies, we also looked at any related randomized trials. For example, for children, there really wasn't a lot of studies for use of um, antiretroviral drugs for PEP, so there was a bit of reviewing some of the studies that have been used for treatment. So we also assessed adherence, and last but not least, values, preference, feasibility, and cost, which are important in making the recommendation. The so next slide, please. So let's first talk about um, the best practice guidance for eligibility of PEP. So the first one is that PEP should be offered and initiated as early as possible to all persons with HIV exposure. And ideally, this must happen within 72 hours of exposure. And number two, the eligibility assessment is based on HIV status of the source whenever that's possible. And we also need to take into consideration the background prevalence as well as the epidemiology of the region that you're in. So exposures are um, warranted for PEP for any exposure to bodily fluids, which includes semen, cervical vaginal secretions or blood, but also mucous membrane exposures um, to the eye or to the mouth. Exclusions for PEP were included for an index patient who, who is already positive from another source, or if you knew that the source was actually HIV negative. However, in settings with a high background of HIV prevalence, all eligible exposures should be considered um, for PEP. Let's go to the next slide, please. So when we looked at efficacy, most of this data is actually from animal studies. So 16 studies were included in this review. And what we saw was that there was an overall 89% reduction among those animals who were exposed to PEP compared to those who did not receive um, any PEP. And there was a significant association found between the timing of the PEP as well as the risk of seroconversion. Um, all of these trials used different um, antiretroviral drugs as far as um, the use for PEP. But what they found was there was a lower seroconversion rate associated with TDF compared to the other drugs. Next slide, please. So a systematic review was also conducted, which focused on adherence to PEP for, um, for HIV prevention and also the completion rates. So this slide shows the proportion completing PEP by population. So in this review, when we looked at population, most of the studies when in regards to population were from exposures to non-occupational um, exposure. There are about 34 studies that were non-occupational, 22 occupational, 15 that were a mix, and then 26 that were um, using sexual assault. And overall, what we saw was that 57% of people completed the full 28 days um, of PEP. The highest completion rate was from non-occupational exposure, which was about 66%, where the lowest was from sexual assault, about 40%. And in regards to key populations, and this was comparing MSMs to female sex workers, the, the, the completion rates were higher among MSMs uh, at 67% compared to 48% for the female sex workers. And last but not least, when we looked at age, the completion rates were lowest among the adolescents at about 36% compared to children and adults, which is not very uh, surprising and quite similar when you look at ART as well. Next slide, please. 
So a systematic review was also done to assess safety and efficacy of the ARV options for PEP. Most of these studies, I must say, are in adults. Um, one thing I want to point out is that some of these studies, 15 of them, provided information for a two-drug regimen, while about 10 provided information on a uh, three-drug regimen. And the third drug was mostly PIs, with the exception of one study. So when we looked at adverse events, the pool proportion of discontinuation of PEP due to adverse events was lowest among the population that received TDF-based PEP. And it was about 0.3% versus 3.2% for those who received zidovudine-based um, PEP. And on the other side, when you look at completion rates, among the studies that used two drugs, the PEP completion rates were 78% for those who received TDF-based PEP versus 59% for those who received zidovudine-based PEP. And among those that received three drugs, it's important to note here that Favarenz actually was not used in any of these studies that were included in this review. And that the completion rates were highest for the group that received TDF-based um, regimens, with the third drug being either lopinavir, ritonavir, raltegravir, darunavir, and also boosted adizanavir. So among all the three drug um, regimens, the one that had the lowest completion rate was that that received zidovudine 3TC and lopinavir atonavir. So these findings basically the support, support the use of TDF-based um, combined therapy with either 3TC and FTC for PEP as the preferred backbone and the choice of the third drug based on what is readily available. So two drugs work, but adding a third I think is uh, a little bit better. So next slide, please. So as I said earlier, the, the studies presented previously were primarily from adults, and there's very limited data for PEP in the pediatric population. So here we see three studies that were included for the review for the evidence of PEP in, in pediatrics. And what we have here are um, three studies in three different settings. Two of them are from non-occupational exposure, whereas one is from sexual assault. They all varied with age, but the age is pretty similar, but it ranges from 1 to 17, but on average it's about 7.6 years of age. Next slide, please. So of these three studies that we looked at, again, all three used AZT and 3TC as the two-drug regimen for PEP in children. So two of these studies reported discontinuation rates, and this was due to adverse events, and about 4.5% of um, the population discontinued due to adverse events. All three um, reported completion rates. However, the overall quality of evidence was pretty low. So the, the PEP completion rates were about 64% among these children. And again, the proportion of discontinuation was primarily due to adverse events. So next slide, please. So in weighing the benefits and the harm, really there was no data that was available on the use of efavirenz, lopinavir, ritonavir, adizanavir, and raltaglavir in PEP for children. And there was also a discussion about the the adverse events or the GI effects of lopinavir ritonavir, especially in, in the context of PEP. Um, sometimes you have GI side effects, however, they are time limited. There was a lot of discussion about the CNS side effects of efavirenz, so these are less common in children, but you have the limitation of the use of efavirenz in children under the age of three. And while ritaglavir did overall have a good toxicity profile and also did um, do very well in regards to completion rates, 
The issue of availability and a child-friendly formulation and resource-limited settings was, was also up for debate. So the committee had a hard time recommending a, a drug that was not readily available. So there was a bit of uncertainty. Next slide, please. So at the end in the discussion, uh, the big debate was basically between lopinavir-based um, PEP versus efavirenz-containing PEP. And some of the, the issues um, in regards to values and preferences that came up was that lopinavir syrup really has poor palatability and has potentially low acceptability in regards to children taking the syrup. Um, in regards to different formulations, they are sprinkle and now I can call it formulations, but availability is still sketchy and not many people have access to formulations other than um, the syrup. There's also the use of the favorins or lopinavirotonavir as the third drug for PEP in children. Was, it was anticipated that favorins may be preferred among healthcare workers and this was primarily based on the fact that efavirenz-based um, ART is the preferred option for um, first-line ART and also used um, for adults as well for ART. So when we were aligning drug choices for PEP with those of other key antiretroviral interventions, it's likely that it's likely to be favored by policymakers to make sure that the, the drug that you choose is one that's easy to procure. So really that put us down to either efavirenz or lopinavir. And if, so efavirenz and lopinavir were basically the preferred drug based on policymakers and um, those who were making procurements. And the survey was also done for healthcare providers prior to this meeting in what they considered um, the best options for children under three. So based on the fact that lopinavir was now the preferred drug for ART, the healthcare providers thought that lopinavir ritonavir was the preferred option. However, in children who were three to 10 years of age, there was a preference for efavirenz. So after a lot of debate, um, the committee did decide that based on all the options, um, lopinavir was basically the preferred option over um, efavirenz, and so it may be preferred over um, efavirenz. Next slide, please. Linda, can you clarify which slide you're on? Is it 13 or 14? The feasibility slide. Resource feasibility. Resource. Are we up here? Resources. That slide's not there. Okay. There's prescribing practices. No, it's two slides behind that. Risk and benefits? No. Okay, I'll skip over that. Okay. So, do you have slides for recommendations? The recommended regimens? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Slide 13, yes. So I'll just briefly talk about feasibility. Um, most of the countries use lopinavir, ritonavir as the preferred choice for second line. So it was thought that it would be relatively widely available for children and therefore favored. Um, so even though efavirenz was widely used in regards to first-line treatment, the fact that there was a limitation for the age under three um, posed a preference to lopinavir ritonavir, and the limitations of, of indications for adizanavir kind of ruled that out, as well as the limitation of availability for raltegravir. So the preferred drug of choice for, ad, for adults and adolescents um, was TDF and XTC, with the third drug being lopinavir-ritonavir or adizanavir. 
The alternative backbone was AZT and 3TC, and again, this is because the evidence showed that TDF um, had better completion rates as well as adherence. And the other alternative for the third drug was rotagravir, darunavir, and efavirenz. And but either of the options were okay for adults, and it was really based on what was readily available. So in terms, in regards for children under the age of 10, the preferred regimen um, was with a backbone of AZT and 3TC, and this was primarily because the evidence that was there only had the use of those two drugs. The alternative backbones, TDF and XTC and Abacavir 3TC, were left there as um, alternatives, but um, there was some issue of the use of TDF and bone toxicity, and at the time, I don't think the CHAFAS results were are out with the back of and 3TC. So again, as with the adult, there is still an alternative of using any of the, the third drug alternatives for adizanavir, raltaglavir, and averapine, and efavirenz, and this was done so that clinicians could have the option of um, another third drug, depending on what they had um, readily available. So next slide, please, and I think that's prescribing practices. Yes, it is. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. All right. So when we looked at prescribing practices, um, basically PEP has been prescribed in two ways, um, either with a starter pack or as a full 28-day um, prescription. So starter packs have been used in some settings to facilitate initiation by non-experts or in an attempt to encourage adherence or trying to assess toxicity and providing additional counseling um, for PEP. And sometimes in patients who are anxious in view of maybe a decision to discontinue. So a systematic review was done on the evidence that was available and they looked at the following outcomes. They looked, and these outcomes included um, PEP refusal, completion rates, discontinuation um, after exposure to an either HIV negative or HIV positive um, source, adverse drug reactions, and defaulting. And overall, they were better outcomes for the full course of prescription versus starter packs. What you see is that there was an 11% refusal for those who received the full prescription compared to 22% refusal for those who received starter packs. And there was a higher rate of completion for the full course um, with 70% completing um, PEP for those who were prescribed full course compared to 53%. And if you look down at the bottom of the slide, over a quarter of the individuals who received the starter packs actually failed to return for a subsequent visit um, where they would have received the remainder of the prescription. Next slide. So basically, this evidence suggests that starter packs don't actually improve adherence and may result in lower completion rates. So therefore, the full 28-day course um, should be provided. Next slide, please. So last but not least, we discussed adherence support. Um, to the best of the committee's knowledge, there was there is no clear guidance on the effective minimum level for adherence um, in regards to PEP. However, three randomized uh, clinical trials were reviewed, and these trials attempted to measure adherence compared to standard of care. Each of these trials did have a different um, counseling intervention, though, and the exposure also was a bit different. So in the first study, they looked at um, patients who had exposure due to sexual assault, and their intervention assessed telephone, um, their intervention included telephone-based um, psychosocial support, giving the leaflets, and also the use of an adherence diary. In the second um, study by Bent, it focused on non-occupational exposure with treatment of PEP-related stress management and also focusing on the individual's perception 
of the, the drug itself. And this was done over four sessions. And the last study really focused on high-risk individuals. Um, so it was MSM exposure and using PEP adherence counseling to see if this made a difference. And each of these trials basically pointed in the direction of benefit for um, adherence counseling. However, only one of them was statistically significant, but the sample size for that was, was pretty small. So it's important to note that all three studies actually did have low levels of adherence, between 38 and 54 um, percent. Next slide, please. So basically, based on this evidence, what we see is that simple adherence counseling may really not be enough due to the low adherence rates, even with intervention especially since this medication is being provided prophylactically and individuals are generally healthy and really not motivated to take the medication. So even though we need more studies on maybe the psychosocial predictors of PEP, in the meantime, we suggest that enhanced adherence and counseling would be beneficial when providing PEP, but um, more evidence is needed on this. Next slide, please. So in summary, um, these, this is the recommendation that came from the committee. So a regimen of PEP for HIV with two drugs is effective, but three drugs is preferred. And AZT3TC is the recommendation that is the preferred backbone for, for PEP for children under the age of 10 years. And the back of your 3TC or TDF3TC can be considered as alternatives. Lopinavir ritonavir is the recommended um, third drug option for PEP for children under 10. And alternatives still remain as adizanavir, raltaglavir, darunavir, fabrins, and nevirapine. So the recommendations are a 28-day prescription of these drugs. And um, we encourage enhanced adherence counseling. I think I'll stop there, but I'd like to acknowledge the committee members that were involved in um, coming up with these, with these guidelines and recommendations. So, Thank you very much, Linda, for your presentation. And we'll move on to the next presentation on uh, skin and opportunistic infection guidelines. Um, can everyone see the slides? Please just type in and let us know because um, the next few slides are heavy and then after this presentation we'll take some questions. So without further ado I'll turn it over to Lulu Muhe Musa who formerly worked for the Maternal, Newborn, and Child Health Department at the WHO and is now a private consultant and honorary professor at Addis Ababa University. I turn it over to you, Lulu, to discuss the guidelines on skin and oral HIV-associated conditions in children and adults. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you very much. It is also an honor for me to just come back and look at my own guidelines. Uh, at this stage, we should have been talking about the implementation of the guideline, but I think a lot of people have not yet uh, heard about it. The history of the skin and oral OI guideline is part of the, the bigger OI guidelines that WHO was trying to push. So the, prior to this, we had a cryptococcal infection guideline. Uh, it was at that stage that we, WHO decided that we should have both adult and uh, pediatric guidelines together. Before that, we had guidelines on uh, pneumococcal, um, not pneumococcal, pneumonia and diarrhea and opportunistic infections in children alone. Uh, so uh, basically at that stage we were just thinking of the pediatric uh, population. So now when it comes to skin and oral HIV conditions, uh, if we go to the next, uh, how do you call that? Uh, uh, why did we take 
these conditions, uh, one main reason, they are very common. I mean, anybody who just walks through a pediatric outpatient uh, could just uh, see quite a number of uh, kids uh, with obvious manifestations of uh, the skin. So it's a very high, a very highly prevalent condition. Some of them are quite uh, fatal. Uh, for example, Kaposi sarcoma. In the case of uh, uh, HIV-infected children and adults, uh, HIV skin is uh, uh, is an indicator. Uh, uh, disease, uh, skin conditions. Uh, 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 in fact, they are probably the most important reason why you have stigma and discrimination. HIV manifests mainly on the skin, and people have cannot hide uh, the skin manifestations. And it's a very important area that uh, uh, we should uh, uh, address. So, going to the next slide. Uh, so basically, the objective is the same. We want to uh, develop uh, guidelines through a systematic process, the GRC process that we've been talking about, and combining both adults and, and children. So what are these guidelines uh, about? Uh, we, we looked at a large number of skin and oral conditions. Uh, you can guess something like 40, 50 of them are there. Uh, but of course, we cannot really do systematic reviews of all these conditions. It takes a lot of time and a lot of money. Uh, some of these conditions, like Kaposi there, you, we did actually three systematic reviews. Uh, the others we were able to manage with one systematic review. So what we did was we, we developed criteria for selection. I hope you see the, the slides. Uh, you, you see on the right side of the, this slide the criteria for selection. Some of them are obvious criteria, uh, like burden of disease and severity. Um, and based on that, and using a selected uh, steering group from among the guideline development group, we, we've, we, we worked with a few of them who decided that we can work on on 10 of these conditions. So we have 10 conditions here, uh, some representing like Stephen Johnson syndrome is really representing the, uh, the drug reactions. And as you know, there, there are many of these uh, uh, conditions, but uh, Stephen Johnson being probably the most severe uh, uh, extreme form of uh, reactions in HIV population. So we chose that one. Uh, uh, now, some principles that we wanted to we show in the guidelines, uh, and these guidelines are already uh, on our website, by the way, on the WHO website. If you go to the Maternal, uh, Newborn, Child, and Adolescent Health website of WHO, under guidelines, it's actually the, the guideline, the first, uh, the, the one that is uh, most at the top of under guidelines. So uh, we have, if one of the principles is if you have this size and the HIV status is not known, we recommend that HIV testing be done immediately because these are indicator uh, skin conditions. That's one. If uh, this is an HIV infected child, uh, then we recommend that um, uh, the child be assessed for eligibility for uh, ART. Uh, so these are some of the bigger pictures. Now uh, the, the target audience is obviously for a, a broader group of uh, people, uh, not only the HIV population, but also other uh, child health uh, professionals. Uh, and in the guideline, in the recommendations, we made sure that uh, at the end of the recommendation, we say that these recommendations also apply for non-HIV uh, populations. Because a lot of the systematic review, as you will see, has been done for, uh, in fact, all population, and then we selected for HIV population and then children and, uh, and adults. Um, 
So we start with Kaposi, Kaposi sarcoma, uh, 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 and what I'm going to do, I'm not going to go into the really the data of each of these conditions. There are 10 conditions, a lot of them are huge, and the documents are, if you want to look at the systematic reviews, they are also on the WHO website. Some of them are being published. Uh, so what I'm going to do is really give you the highlight of what the recommendation says uh, and uh, some of the rationale for choosing this drug or that drug. Basically, I will not go beyond, uh, beyond that. Uh, the first thing, uh, the first challenge about Kaposi sarcoma was that we needed actually uh, an, uh, a group that is very much geared towards this oncology because the, the, the treatment of Kaposi is unlike the other skin conditions around uh, uh, treatment of uh, cancer. Uh, uh, and therefore, we needed a separate group uh, that would work on Kaposi sarcoma. And I can tell you that uh, even within that group, uh, agreeing on the staging of Kaposi sarcoma for adults and then for children was uh, quite a lot of work. But in the guideline, as, as you see, I hope, hopefully the guideline will standardize and people will follow uh, what has been agreed uh, by the group. So the staging is important because the recommendation is based on the staging. If the disease staging or classification is mild to moderate, in fact, the recommendation is basically to start ART immediately. While if it is severe or uh, more complex, and these uh, classifications are are defined very uh, in detail in the guideline, you need to add, in addition to ART, uh, chemotherapy. Now, so the moment chemotherapy came into our guideline, of course, uh, we start, everybody starts to ask, okay, chemotherapy at what level? In, you know, thinking of the HIV settings we are talking about, you know, which centers can do chemotherapy, you know? So we, we really discussed, and in the guideline, you will see that uh, we recommend and we go into details of uh, uh, improving infrastructure, uh, improving uh, capacity of personnel, training of personnel on, on chemotherapy, because I think we need to uh, expand uh, chemotherapy for Kaposi sarcoma into, rather than keeping it into a few centers at the national level, it should go really below, and that's the only way we can save, uh, we can save life. But it's quite a tricky issue. Uh, <laughs> and these were the, uh, the, uh, the recommended regimens. As you can see, vincristine with pleomycin and uh, doxorubicin, uh, these were kind of the baseline drugs that were recommended. Uh, and if, of course, uh, in a few centers where you may have liposomal anthracyclines, which are expensive and not usually available, uh, then, of course, you can use those also. Now, the next one is seborrheic dermatitis. Uh, um, so, again, uh, classification into mild seborrheic dermatitis and severe, uh, and uh, the drug, the main drug uh, for mild seborrheic dermatitis is topical uh, ketoconazole, and the, your details are there. Uh, and the rationale for some of this is where well, the evidence has not been uh, a lot. Uh, especially in HIV population, it was limited. Uh, uh, but comparing drugs for non-HIV population, uh, ketoconazole was the strongest uh, in this uh, in the systematic review. Uh, uh, so basically, the, this was the recommendation. Maybe I should not spend more time. Uh, Prurytic papular eruption is the other uh, uh, condition. Uh, and uh, as you can see, the recommendation is basically ART. Uh, you, we recommend additional symptomatic therapy with antihistamines and uh, topical corticosteroids, uh, and you see the rationale for that, but uh, basically ART would be 
the primary treatment for pruritic papular eruption. Uh, and the, in the meeting, the, the guideline meeting, of course, one of the issues that came out was that uh, if you follow at that stage, uh, if you follow the clinical staging of HIV, uh, uh, HIV, then uh, prurotic papular eruption comes as stage two, and uh, and then uh, uh, the the indication for ART is stage three and four at that time, and uh, uh, and we were saying that in a way, so these patients are symptomatic and they respond to uh, ART. Uh, so this would be the most recent recommendation that we would follow. Another similar condition is eosinophilic folliculitis. Again, very much uh, uh, a, a similar uh, recommendation that ART should be the primary treatment, uh, and that uh, additional symptomatic therapy could include uh, antihistamines. Uh, the evidence was very low and uh, mostly expert opinion, basically. I must say that in both PPE and the xenophilic folliculitis, uh, we tried in the, and you'll see in the, in the guideline to link up because uh, even though uh, they are, these are state two, but the CD4 count of most of these uh, patients is actually quite low. Now, TNA infection is a common infection, and uh, 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 and we uh, we just the picture we saw is on the screen. But I think the most important ones are the extensive TNA infections that involve the nails and the hair, uh, which are difficult to treat. And uh, and uh, the recommendations, as you can see there. Uh, for not extensive with terbinafine, which is available there. And by the way, for some of our recommendations, the reason for you know, primarily recommending this antifungal and not the other one is if they are already in the WHO essential medicines list, we prioritize them. Herpes zoster <coughs> is uh, another common condition. Uh, and uh, the, the, there are good randomized control trials actually comparing acyclovir, uh, famciclovir, and uh, valaciclovir, uh, and uh, more or less quite effective uh, drugs. Uh, and uh, in terms of availability, we felt acyclovir is more available and it costs us less. And therefore, the group decided that a cyclobar would be the primary drug for uh, treating herpes. Scabies is another common condition, and here we focused actually on the, uh, on the again, the extensive scabies, uh, uh, or sometimes called Norwegian scabies, I think with the, that word is being abandoned. Uh, so we have two types, as you can see, classical, and crusted scabies, and the treatments uh, are more or less the ones that are being practiced now. Molluscum contagiosum, another common condition, more uh, in children and more uh, in HIV-infected children, extensive molluscum contagiosum, uh, and the group decided that ARH should be, uh, in fact, the, the sole uh, treatment for extensive uh, molluscum contagiosum. Oropharyngeal candidiasis, uh, uh, quite a number of drugs, good systematic reviews where we had Cochrane reviews already actually at that stage, uh, and oral fluconazole uh, has been found to be highly effective, single dose and uh, better availability in, ter in terms of toxicity also compared to ketoconazole or uh, etraconazole, uh, uh, less toxic and less drug reaction. So th that would be the primary drug. And now, Steven Johnson syndrome, as I said, is we picked one of the drug reactions, basically, in the more severe form of drug reactions. But the systematic review really did not yield much. We, uh, 
Uh, therefore, the really the, what the guideline group decided was that where there is uh, obvious uh, evidence for a causal a causative drug, of course, the conclusion would be to discontinue the cause of that uh, reaction. Uh, otherwise, there was no evidence. And uh, with regards to the use of steroids, uh, especially in children, uh, that it may actually decrease survival, uh, and it may place uh, the HIV, it may place HIV-infected patient at at more risk of another sepsis because of its uh, effect on immunity. So basically, look for uh, the causative drug or agent and remove the agent. So that is really the conclusion of the uh, the. Now, so what we said, uh, these are the 10 conditions, uh, but we have another 40, 50 conditions scheme. And uh, for WHO, this is the, the first time we are producing a guideline on skin and, or on infections. We probably will not have them in, in a short time, at least. So we decided that we will have a tool that will include all the conditions that we we started with around 40, 50, and in a simplified manner, uh, how to diagnose them. Uh, so we, you know, using morphology, uh, photos of the conditions, because the, the skin conditions are in terms of they are, you know, malleable to this kind of uh, presentation you see on that slide. And uh, we field tested them in five, six countries in, I remember, Uganda, Tanzania, South Africa, and in Asia, and uh, the algorithms that we put there worked well, and fortunately the guideline review committee agreed to, to adding that one into the, uh, into the work we are doing. So there is a small chapter there in the guideline, but there is also a separate uh, tool that uh, we actually agreed with Martina that the IIT could use because the IIT sits in a better position to disseminate the tool uh, and, and, uh, and use it. So if I'm up to date on the information, uh, it's being formatted and will soon be uh, disseminated to every one of you. And it's very easy. So before I finish, I think I need to of the informality of the GRC, and uh, if you want to pick at them. Uh, we emphasize that children are behind. Uh, all systematic reviews show that there is less research. Uh, and then, of course, to thank everyone. Uh, you can look for your name in there. It's a huge group there uh, who have contributed to this work, uh, and I just coordinated it. So basically, thank you very much. Maybe we we can send uh, uh, the to if they want to browse or read them or use them or change them into their language. You know, everything they can do this is for public. So uh, thank you very much. I will stop here. Okay, thank you so much, Lulu, for your presentation. And we'll open it up now for uh, questions. As usual, we will share all of the presentations and the recording following the webinar for your information and link to um, any additional resources. Um, so please send in your questions. Um, I think the first question is from Yaye. Uh, it's directed towards Linda, and it said, would you please speak up about the relevance of PEP in humanitarian emergencies, especially if you have the experience? But um, I'm, anyone from the WHO team, feel free to contribute. And the second is, since the duration of PEP is 28 days, how is the practicality of enhanced adherence? So I guess she's asking regarding how practical is enhanced adherence. Okay. Um, 
I, I must say I don't have much experience in humanitarian emergencies, but the, the drugs that were recommended were the ones that are aligned with those used in treatment. So in issues where there are humanitarian emergencies, the hope was that access to the, the regimens that were recommended would be readily available. Um, and in regards to the duration of the 28 days, I think the, the primary message is at the time when the full prescription is being given to the patients, any form of adherence counseling support would be beneficial. I mean, overall, even in the studies that were reviewed, there were low adherence rates, but there really isn't an, enough evidence on adherence support um, in regards to PEP. I'm not sure if uh, Martina or Nathan want to, to add on to that as well. Sure. Yeah, hi, um, Nathan here. So on, on the first point, um, we have an interagency task team on humanitarian emergencies and these recommendations have been, which, which includes um, UNHCR, WFP, UNICEF, um, a, a range of non-governmental humanitarian agencies. And these guidelines have been discussed with that group and several members of that group um, were either members of the guideline development group for PEP or um, observers as um, they came from affiliated UN agencies. Um, I think the principal concern in humanitarian settings is sexual assault. Um, and, um, well, as, as Linda had said, there, there, there is alignment between drugs for treatment and drugs for PEP, specifically to try and encourage availability in all circumstances. Um, and certainly there's no reason why we would see that um, regimens would be different in emergency settings compared to other settings. Um, and finally, to note that the UN um, PEP kits that are distributed including in humanitarian settings, um, will be revised and aligned with these guidelines. And then on the second point um, around adherence, there were only three studies that were um, identified that assessed adherence interventions, and they, each of them did a slightly different thing. So one study provided adherence support across the full 28 days, um, whereas another study only provided adherence support in the first week. Um, so it, it's very difficult to say exactly what enhanced adherence support should look like because it's not been very extensively studied and where it has been studied, each study has done something slightly different. But the reason we made this a, a recommendation in the guideline is recognizing that completion rates for PEP are very um, inadequate. It, it's only around 50% um, on average. And so we want to encourage that practitioners think about um, supporting recipients of PEP in, in whatever way they can in their setting, recognizing that current uptake, is, uh, so current completion rates are not good. Um, and, and if that's just providing better adherence support at baseline, um, rather than across the full 28 days, perhaps that's already something. Um, and we'll be, we'll be looking in the future to, to try and see how to better um, refine this recommendation. But this was, this was really just to recognize that we need to do a better job of supporting patients through to completion. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan, for shedding light on administering PEP in humanitarian uh, emergencies and also for um, clarifying why ed enhanced adherence was in in referred to in the recommendations. And the next question is from uh, Jacqueline, who, said, who asked, when it is determined that the indexed patient is negative, the recommendation is that there is no need for PEP. How do you address issues around the window period in high prevalence settings? Yeah. yeah, actually the recommendation is that in highly prevalent settings you do give PEP regardless of exposure for that very reason, um, for being in the window period. Okay, great. Thank you for that clarification. It, that, that was on the slide, I remember, uh, one of the last bullet points. And then I think another question of clarification or, or um, 
confirmation regarding um, and perhaps it's just a, a, a trying to better understand what was said in one of the slides was that um, some people stopped PEP when they found out uh, their HIV positive status. Why sh so? It should continue, no? Linda, can you address that question? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Um, some of the patients did discontinue PEP due to um, adverse events. So I I can give we can send you the references for the papers for those particular patients. I'm not sure, Nathan, do you have anything to add on this one? Yeah, so this is Martina. I just wanted to chime in. I think that uh, what is referred is that obviously if that person is eligible for treatment, uh, drugs would be continued, right? Um, and I guess that in the direction of treating all people living with HIV including pregnant women and, and children and adolescents, then that would be the case, always the case. But in the past, uh, one would have assessed CD4 and the need for treatment in that specific case. So uh, that's a slight nuance that you may have seen in the slides. Okay, great. Um, the next question is also regarding PEP. Since most PEP clients were from non-occupational sources, is the PEP distributed combined with the other two STI treatment and family planning, I believe that stands for? Well, for non-occupational um, sources, would that be with sexual assault? Then the, the answer would be yes. Okay, so However, I think that... those the specific recommendations for STI treatment and family planning are, are not included in these guidelines. Okay. Great, thank you. And is there any study that shows whether there are more or less side effects when a two or three drug PEP regimen is used? Um, from, from the data we reviewed, um, there is actually a slide that shows the proportion of adverse events. I'm not sure what number it is and what you presented, but there is a slide that shows the proportion of adverse events in the uh, using two drugs versus three drugs. Um, there really wasn't that much difference. I think the primary difference was the, the combination of drugs. So those that contained AZT had um, higher episodes of adverse events compared to those who were CDF um, which included TDF, and and this this a similar pattern is seen even when you add the um, the third drug, where the TDF had less side effects, even with the third drug combined. Okay, so you're you're clarifying that the the side effects was really based on the drugs contained in the regimen, whether it was AZT or TDF, versus the number of drugs included in the regimen. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'd just like Anyone to ask. Else? Sure. Uh, thanks. Um, so that that's um, looking at the totality of the evidence again, as as um, as was made clear in the presentation, the number of studies for children, as usual, was very limited. Um, what what was curious? Um, I mean, it is clear that adding an extra drug will add a certain degree of toxicity. But what was what was interesting in the review is that although um, adverse event rates reporting may have increased with the addition of the third drug, the overall completion rates were the same. So, so there may be more side effects, but those side effects are not leading um, to substantial discontinuation rates. And so overall, the guideline expert group had to balance um, simplicity, 
background drug resistance, alignment with treatment, um, and altogether came to the view that um, three drugs was uh, preferred over two drugs. Thank you, Nathan. Any other questions, comments? Does anyone want to share experiences? If there's um, nothing further, we'll wait a few minutes to see if anyone uh, sends in questions. But um, I guess we'll take this opportunity uh, to thank all of you for your patience and understanding as we sorted out the slides. and. Uh, it was wonderful to see at the peak of the webinar, we had um, almost 70 participants um, despite the time of year, which is a time of year where many people go on leave, and it's summertime, so we really appreciate all of your support. Um, and we also have somebody adding uh, a comment uh, from Swaziland saying the experience on starter packs not improving adherence may be a lesson learned for the option B plus, I believe that should say starter packs practiced by some countries. And also a clar another clarifying question regarding PEP from Yaye, how high is high referring to prevalence to start PEP? So we, um, we made the decision to try and keep the criteria for starting PEP as simple as possible um, because the alternative could be to have a very, very long list of different exposure risks and, a ver and, a, and also a list of a sort of prevalence calculator um, to match against the exposures. And we, we really didn't feel um, it would be appropriate to go in, in that direction, but rather to keep it as simple as possible and leave certain um, amount of space for countries to make their own decisions. But of course, um, back, back, it's not only an issue of background prevalence, it's background prevalence combined with exposure type. Um, so those two factors needed to be taken into account together. Um, so for that reason, I, I, I'm afraid we can't give you a clear answer on that, and it wasn't something that we looked at. OK, thank you for that response, Nathan. And any anyone would like to comment on Florence's uh, contribution regarding uh, starter packs in the option B plus context? We can also uh, follow up following the webinar to perhaps exchange more information and knowledge about that experience and, and how it could be shared or lessons learned um, as it could apply to different contexts and guidelines. So without any further ado, um, we would like to profusely thank all of our presenters, Martina Penazato, Dorothy Mborigacha, um, Linda Barlow Mosha, Lulu Muhe Musa. Thank you so much for uh, your enlightening presentations and for really giving us some deep dives on the important guidelines that and supplements that were uh, released by WHO and giving us a taste of what will be coming at the end of this year. Um, and also to Nathan Ford for, as well for your insightful responses to many of the questions, to Nandita Sugandi of CHAI and who is another co-chair of the ITT Child Survival Working Group for um, doing all the behind the scenes work for organizing uh, the presentations and putting the webinar, helping to put the webinar together. Um, and thank all of you for uh, sticking with us and for participating and for your very engaging uh, questions. To wrap up, as usual, we will uh, send out the presentation, a webinar summary, summary and Q&A transcript. 
um, as well as the recording so that if you missed anything, you'll be able to refer to those documents to uh, read and as a reference. And we'll share any other resources or articles uh, that are related to these guidelines that may be of interest. Martina and uh, the team from WHO, would you like any last words? Just thanking again everyone for attending this webinar. We thought it was very important to disseminate these pieces because not being part of the large guidelines, um, they may get forgotten. So we're happy that so many of you attended and hoping to hear more uh, challenges and opportunities for implementation because obviously some of these pieces uh, will require uh, more work in countries. So, um, Thank you very much again, and um, we'll be keen to follow this up. Okay, great. Thank you, Martina. Until next month, um, enjoy the rest of August, and we hope uh, to hear from all of you either online or in the next webinar. Thank you so much.